Today we had Lucy Wark on our Founder Focus episode, and I think this was a great episode. I absolutely loved it. I haven't met Lucy before. I know you've spent some time in one of her programs through Fuzzy, but I absolutely enjoyed this chat. And what stood out for me was the way Lucy sees the world and approaches things. And we discussed during the chat her mental models and some of the ways that she approaches her own growth journey. Lucy has multiple companies that we discussed through the episode, Fuzzy being one. Fuzzy's a career skill development platform that does a range of things, including a negotiation course, which that's how I first met Lucy going through that course. I love the way she described how she launched that. Like the, the method for launching is itself a good lesson for founders in there. Yeah. And Lucy's a co-founder of Normal, which is a really up and coming sexual wellness brand. In the episode, we don't do a very good job of introing the different businesses. And then I randomly start talking about the sexual revolution and all sorts of things that make me sound like a tremendous creep. Uh, so it's just important to understand that at the 20 minute mark, when we do give Lucy the opportunity to explain what normal is, it wasn't just a random thing on my behalf. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really interesting conversation and especially some of the highlights around the role of social media. I really enjoyed that conversation. And then we talked about Grapevine, an initiative that Lucy's been part of, why it's required, what the goal is and the different support the ecosystem is hopefully providing. Yeah, another important topic. And the outcome of this was we have to get Lucy on again. That was a fantastic conversation. We could have gone down multiple threads in much more detail. All right, well, let's get into it. Lucy, thank you for joining us. We first met when I was doing one of your great negotiation courses. And ever since going through that, I've been excited to have you on because I just think there's a lot of things our listeners can learn. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and for being part of the course. It was uh, delightful. I remember Don often had mixed babysitting duties as well. And so we got to know some very cute kids. <laughs> Don's been talking about this negotiation course a fair bit. So he's been singing the praises and I need to sign up for it. Oh yeah, yeah. come on in. We've got a, another one in about three weeks. Yeah, awesome. I'd prefer that you didn't because I'd like to keep the upper hand. <laughs> in, all, in, in all negotiations now, use my skills. Absolutely. And you know what, as well, we're about to run, I was emailing, I think Don, you would have got this probably a couple of days ago, but we're doing a negotiate an alumni negotiation tournament as well. So the two of you can actually go head to head if the timing's oh, wow. right. Yeah. I wanted to, we've had, this will be our fourth cohort, but we've had quite a few people go through it now. And so many of them have been like, can I find a way to keep practicing? And so I want to do like a tournament over a few weeks. Yeah. It's going to be very fun. A negotiation death match. Yeah, basically, I've got to write a bunch of new scenarios for people to negotiate in. But I think I'm going to get quite creative with these ones. Yeah, we'll get to those because you certainly drew you drew upon your different business pursuits <laughs> in the in the content. But we like to start with a little bit of the origin story. Our, our view is that entrepreneurs come from a range of different backgrounds, but show signs of entrepreneurship early. <laughs> so, we're just what's some of your background, and where do you think your entrepreneurial journey comes from? I'd say I wasn't, my first entrepreneurial venture was very unsuccessful because I hadn't understood the laws of supply and demand very well. So my first venture was attempting to sell pumice stone from the beach on Stradbroke Island where I was surrounded by infinite tree pumice stone. And that, I, I learned something about Mark. But I think maybe just to give people a little bit of background, like I grew up in Brisbane, as we were just talking about before we started. I studied overseas for my undergrad. I was always really passionate about social sciences, like why do people do what they do? So I studied kind of politics, international relations, psychology, sociology, bits of anthropology, like all of the things that help you answer how do individuals think, how do groups work, how does social change happen, that kind of stuff. So I did that at Cambridge and then the University of Chicago and also mixed some business in as well. And then went into consulting at McKinsey after a short stint of startups in Berlin and then moved into the Australian startup community and began the businesses that we'll probably talk about later. But I reckon in terms of entrepreneurial journey, I, I think I was a very like type A perfectionist growing up. So I, I don't think I'd be the type of kid you predict would become an entrepreneur because I think the fear of failure would have been way too high. But I think I had a few very helpful experiences that allowed me to like build an entrepreneurial muscle. And so I often think about it as more of the experience of gradually expanding your comfort zone that can actually make an entrepreneur as well as the 
the kid who at eight has started like an internet business. So one, I think one of those experiences for me was actually moving overseas at 18 with no kind of support or connections and getting to like reinvent myself and discover that I could make the best of a situation. I think that was really fun. I think another one was actually on campus at university, starting a new student magazine at Cambridge with a couple of friends. And that was like our first real piece of entrepreneurship. I think I still have the Gantt chart that I built for it. Um, but it was uh, a really cool experience in a relatively low stakes environment, still felt high stakes to us, but of coming up with a vision of having to think about how are we going to get a whole bunch of people to jump and get on board with this vision at the same time. We needed writers and editors, we needed sponsors, we needed journalistic advisors and get everyone to jump at the same time and make a really high quality product, build an organization, and then eventually like hand over that organization as well. So I think Actually, the experience of doing that was really helpful for me and probably gave me the entrepreneurial bug as well. I think there's something so magical about being able to have an idea and the confidence that comes from like a few months later, looking back and seeing, oh, that idea actually got executed and that thing exists in the world now because we went and took those steps to make it happen. Interestingly, also the people who I worked with on it, one of them is a founder and investor now. And a bunch of the first people who we hired to be the editors-in-chief like became founders too. So I think a whole bunch of people got got the bug from that. It's like the Cambridge News PayPal Mafia version, is it? Everybody went there. An extremely minor PayPal Mafia. Yeah. It's it's interesting. We've had a few of these founder focus sessions now where there's some sort of past experience of early travel, that early gap year or traveling overseas. There seems to be a common pattern for founders and the experience. And I think navigating the world, like an uncharted territory, I think there's parallels, but I'm really curious about the social science aspect. So you mentioned their understanding human behavior. How do you feel those studies have benefited you in the business path you're taking on in your entrepreneurial journey? I, it is so fascinating. I use my social sciences degree like every day (laughs) and I use so many of, I think the mental models that came from it every day, for example, like Behavioral economics um, was something that I was really fascinated by, like all of the cognitive biases and how we assess risk and all of the ways in which we can interpret and misinterpret other people. Like that has become something that's like incredibly valuable for everything from like, how do you manage a team to how do you think about negotiating your business to how do you think about changing people's perspectives or beliefs on a space where they might not feel very comfortable. Or one thing that I also did spend a lot of time on was looking at social movements for things like the gay rights movement or even my thesis, my first dissertation was like about the gun rights or the kind of like gun control movement in the United States and looking at what led led that to succeed or fail. And so much of the kind of principles around like how does opinion change and how do you make opinion salient or non-salient, how do interest groups work, how do you influence popular culture, like All of those things actually have fed really strongly into the instincts that I think I would bring to something like normal. An example I've used before is the, with the gay rights movement, it's one of the most successful social movements ever in terms of the, in public opinion over a very small number of decades from a world where gay people were forced to hide or were prosecuted or would face risks to their life to a world where in at least much of the sort of Western um, world, those burdens are, the legal burdens are substantially reduced or gone. And the culture is incredibly friendly in many ways to the LGBTQ plus community. Don't want to overstate that because there are many ways in which we're backsliding. There's a few different aspects to it. But one of the things that's so powerful about and what's so effective about the gay rights movement was the coming out movement. And that was essentially people making the kind of brave individual decision to come out and speak to their family, friends, colleagues, workplaces about the fact about their sexuality. And I think one of the things that social scientists will look at in that is the dramatic effect of in-group and out-group psychology. So I think for a lot of people, if you don't know anyone who's gay and if you are hearing the public discourse at the time about what it meant to be gay, then it's very easy to demonize and see the gay community as an other. And when you have someone who is in your in-group, which is essentially people you identify with, people you know personally or people who share traits or experiences with you, speaking to you about that, it changes the way that you think about that broader concept. And so that's something that, for example, with normal, we think about a lot, like word of mouth and partners and families and friends and even influencers or creators and people who our audience actually identify with and feel a connection to talking to them about why it's okay to talk about this space and and showing them how to speak about this space like that's 
I think one of those mental models that without realizing has always sat in the back of my mind and how we've like, designed what we do. Yeah. So I, I'm shocked by how much I use my social science degrees. <laughs> It would be fair to say that there's a sexual wellness is revolution too strong a word, but it, it, it seems as time goes on, there's more acceptance that it's actually okay. It doesn't need to be okay. shadows. And is that just a, is that just a generational thing that as every generation comes through the previous generation's hangups get dissolved or is there something else that's giving this environment that it's allowing things to come through? I'd say it's more than just generational. It's a great question, Doug. And perhaps a way to contextualize this is we went through like the 60s and 70s, like sexual revolution at the same time as many other things, the women's rights, the anti-Vietnam War movement, like a whole bunch of other big areas of social and cultural change all kind of happening at the same time. But I think lots of people looked at the sexual revolution and thought, we've got the pill, women can sleep with who they want and we're done. And I think looking back now, many sort of modern observers or critics would actually say that that sexual revolution was occurring in a society that was still relatively dominated in media and in power structures and in politics and in family life by men. And in many ways, that sexual revolution happened in a way that's almost like it's the Hugh Hefner sexual revolution, which <laughs> left a lot of people behind. Didn't necessarily speak fully to what pleasure might look like for women where you're not just objectifying yourself and treating that as like a form of a form of liberation. And what would it look like to, for example, close the gender orgasm gap? Or So I think there's, there's lots of ways in which that sexual revolution was important, but incomplete and occurred differently for different groups. There's criticisms of it. It's like sexual freedom for whom and on whose terms. I think a lot of what we're seeing now is partly fueled by the rise of social media that gives voices to lots of different groups of people, different lived experiences and identities. I think like women, I think of the queer community who perhaps weren't the center in that sexual revolution V1. Like a lot of those groups getting the opportunity to connect with each other, to share ideas and to talk about what like sexual wellness on their terms might look like and to create products for that. And I do think that, yeah, there's like a few kind of pieces of technological change that have really driven the period that we're going through right now. So yeah, like rise of social media, that means everyone can be a broadcaster, everyone can be their own media so that less gatekeeping of whose stories get told. I even think like the switch from a world of three-channel broadcast television into cable television and then eventually into streaming platforms where you can tell many stories, like many more stories to much more to many more small audiences and even expose large audiences to the experiences of people who otherwise probably wouldn't have been centered before. I think a lot of that is like helping to drive what we're seeing at the moment. So yeah, there's a ton of stuff happening, but I think it's more than just generational change. There's also a whole bunch of entrepreneurs who I think the barriers to starting businesses have probably fallen in many ways, and particularly to starting businesses that are doing like either digital education or physical products and selling those online. So there's probably also a contribution happening there. I hope yeah, this I meant- explanation makes sense. It makes sense in my head, but I've been thinking about these trends for a long time. <laughs> It really does make sense. And I love what you said there about the the role of social media, because I think often social media gets a, a collective narrative of bad rap in terms of mm. it, it can be an echo chamber and it, it, there can be a lot of hate speech and ill effects. But I think what you're talking about there in terms of giving people a voice and access to others and creating little sub communities or, or a broader, I guess, chance for public education, I think is something that maybe we don't talk about enough, actually, the positive aspect of social media in, in that. Absolutely. We see this enormously with normal. The biggest ways in which people discover the brand are like word of mouth and organic social media. We can't use a lot of paid social media, so that still gets censored anyway. But for we've had with our educational um, content on social media, it's been viewed, I think, over 30 million times. I need to check whether that number's gone higher, but like we, we reach a huge number of people who otherwise probably wouldn't have been exposed to this kind of content certainly not wouldn't have got it in school and if they are like otherwise they would need to be like seeking it out and finding it in a format that's great for them so I think there's a, an enormous amount of fuel being poured on the fire in a good way by by social media and even I think particularly on issues like sex intimacy relationships lots of people prefer to consume education and support digitally like it's most people don't actually necessarily want to be in like IRL experiencing these conversations we often feel more comfortable that way so I think the ability to do that in a place that you're place and time that you're comfortable with is really helpful as well like 
with your observation about social media and, and the fact that we don't talk enough about the positive benefits in addition to the negatives, like I think like there's a really interesting conversation happening about pornography at the moment and is like widely available free or close to free pornography and the types of pornography that you can access a good or a bad thing for the, um, people's experiences of sex and intimacy. And there are many very val valid criticisms of pornography as it stands today, I'd say. But one thing that I think can sometimes get under told is that particularly for people who are in the LGBTQ plus community, like pornography used to be the only place where you could learn what sex would look like for you, or you could be exposed to what different kinds of sex would look like for you. It was the only place you saw your pleasure on screen. And so one of the things that we see in our research, like with normal, we do large scale research pieces that are demographically representative to dig into a lot of issues around sex and pleasure. One of the things that we see is like the LGBTQ community will disproportionately say like pornography was a valuable educational resource for me. So I, it's always interesting diving into these spaces to actually say, oh yeah, like there's, there are things to consider on both sides of them. Makes sense. I, I've thought about normal in the context of there's a bit of a shift as humans become a bit more enlightened. There's a shift towards, is there more? If you look at what we have today, 50 years ago, they'd look at us and say, well, you must be the happiest people on the planet, but everything you want, you've got everything you need, but actually, at least in my journey, there's got to be more than this. And, and on the sexual revolution side, if that's the right way to describe it, sort of maybe before it was fine to have an orgasm, but now we want a really good orgasm. Like it's, <laughs> it's just across, across so many different mm -hmm. facets of life. What was once acceptable now, what's next? What's more? Am I a bit off the reservation with that thinking or? No, I think that you're speaking to something which is a very true trend where I think there is, and it's something that we notice a lot in, when, in the spaces where we're speaking about sex, that people often bring an optimization mindset to their sex lives. Like, how can I be having the best sex every time or better and better sex? And is there a better orgasm out there? And it probably explains why whenever brands make content about a new kind of orgasm or multiple orgasms or like a different spot in the body that's been discovered that blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it always performs really well. And I, I, I think that there's, there can often be a mixture of, of genuine curiosity and desire and a wish to explore something and see if there's an experience that you're going to really value there and also a degree of FOMO or insecurity in how people engage with a lot of that discourse that because most of us experience our sex lives in silos where you might not many other we don't necessarily have super open conversations about what the person next to you like does in bed and what that feels like for them, there can often be a question of is mine as good as theirs that plays into people's minds. And certainly I think this is a point where I'd normally tap out and ask um, my co-founder, Georgia Grace, who's an amazing sex coach, to speak. But I think one thing that she'll talk about a lot as well is that it can be very unhealthy and unhelpful to put that kind of pressure onto yourself or your partners or your sex life. And there's a lot of pretty good evidence as well that, for example, being orgasm centric can actually reduce people's pleasure and reduce people's overall satisfaction and enjoyment with their sex lives. And if, sometimes if you're working through a sexual issue or a sexual dysfunction, a very common technique is actually getting partners to take orgasm off the table and say, we are not, as we kind of work through whatever it is what we're doing, we actually are not going to focus on orgasming or even we're not going to have, if you define sex as um, penetration in that couple, we're not going to do penetrative sex. We are just doing these activities. And it's about thinking about what pleasure can come from those activities and then um, releasing the expectation on you. I think there can be some really interesting, complicated questions thrown up by the kind of optimization mindset that a lot of people take in sexual wellness. And it, it's certainly something where I worry that, um, yeah, that people like are doing the Tim Ferriss thing to their sex lives. I don't know if that is a good thing to do. But on the other side of that, maybe optimization isn't always our friend. Like discourse would be, I think that there are historically like people whose pleasure has not been centered in the sex that we're having. For anyone who's not aware of it, the gender orgasm gap in Australia is basically like a measurement of do you 
always or almost always orgasm in partnered sex. And women experience orgasm at about half the rate of men in Australia. And there are very good reasons why. And one of those is the sex that we've all seen growing up in porn and pop culture is often like penetrative penis and vagina sex with very little outer course or foreplay beforehand. And any sex coach will tell you like that for most people with a vulva, about 20 to 30% will orgasm from penetration alone, 80-ish percent need clitoral stimulation. So if that's not a big part of the sex that you're having, and if you've grown up seeing sex as this thing, then of course it's like the gender orgasm gap is a really big sort of natural consequence of that. So I also want to be like, let's not, you know, be wary of chasing the orgasm, but also it'd be nice to have orgasm equality. No, nah, complicated. There's a lot of cross currents in this space because people have really different lived experiences. Even one that I've been noticing a lot lately is midlife sexual awakenings, which has been really fascinating. Particularly, a lot of people tell me about their sex lives unprompted, like that's the hazard of the job. But yeah, like lots of sort of women, I would say in like their 40s, 50s, 60s, even 70s, who are either exploring sex and dating after divorce or the death of a partner or a separation or who are encountering via the internet and then the growing like traditional media coverage of this space, the sexual wellness like revolution or movement or whatever you want to call it, and who are thinking about maybe I want to try a vibrator. I wouldn't have felt comfortable 20 years ago, but I'm very comfortable now or I want to give this a go or a friend of mine said it was a good idea. And so it's been really cool and interesting. Like I think watching a demographic who are often neglected and who are not seen as the center of this conversation actually really starting to take up a lot of this as well because it's certainly it's huge with the gen z and millennials but i think it's also it's worth calling out that i i think there's like a growing kind of a second wave that is starting to happen with older generations too it's, yeah it's, it's it, fascinating times it's a fascinating topic we might have to do two yeah. or three episodes i think yeah. but yeah You've mentioned normal a couple of times for, for listeners who might not mm. be familiar with it. Do you want to give a bit of a, yes. the Genesis story and the pitch? Yeah, for sure. Normal is a, a sex toy company. We make um, a modern range of kind of beautiful, shame-free sex toys. We pair them with tons of um, education to help you figure out what it'll do for you and how to use it. Um, and we also use um, the sales of those to help fund making free digital online sex education. For example, like our first big video course, which is about two hours long. It's our sex coach, Georgia, explaining what she would teach in clinic on the 16 biggest questions that we get asked as a brand. It's basically a movie about how to have good sex. So that one's been seen in over 40 countries. We launched that sort of two or three years ago. Since then, we've launched a couple of other big ones. So one that's focused on the biggest issues for couples, another that's focused on body confidence, which is actually the single biggest issue for women in Australia when it comes to sex. We have a huge library of sex ed articles. We create lots of sex education on social media. So it's I would say it's a profitable business, but it's a business that's also has a pretty strong social mission running through the way that we, the way that we think. Yeah. So that's normal. And we launched with the support of Eucalyptus. So we're one of the five Eucalyptus brands and then spun off at the end of 2022. So it's been operating independently since then. Great. I, I wasn't aware of that. From an operational point of view with normal, there's, you've got the brand, you've got the marketing. I've really liked the yeah. ambassador channels that you've gone down with Abby, but then you've also got to design the products, get the products built, get them shipped, all of that. Like it's, it's at, at the business level, I think it's quite fascinating. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned and, and for our listenership, their entrepreneurs and their investors that will be investing in these companies, what, what would in that, what did you wish you knew? This was like a slightly embarrassing one for me, but I think really understand unit economics. And like, I think one thing that has actually been a really helpful journey is like going from a world of launching with eucalyptus and being to some degrees like insulated by venture money raised at the top of the market from like, I think the consequence of decisions to moving into a world where it's like P&L ownership and having to be super disciplined about how do we think about managing the business. I, I think that a lot of that you do learn through the process of doing it. Like I think there is a, a muscle that gets built, but I do think that like I I probably could have invested earlier on in just being like completely across the like the PL and the unit economics. And it's something that like over time I've become much better at doing. I think a lot of that also happens for entrepreneurs when if you're seeking venture funding. It's very easy to chase growth and be extremely growth focused and not have a clear view of profitability or a, a path to profitability and sustainability in the back of your mind. And 
I think that can often be reinforced by venture investors as well, who are looking for particular things from the companies that they're backing at different points in time as well. So that was certainly like one really valuable thing for me, just getting super disciplined about that and also being good lessons, how to get up a learning curve and how to think about the running a company. So the way that I mentally visualize normal is there's probably, as you alluded to there, 10 function areas, like there's marketing, there's finance, there's operations, there is new product development, there, and you've learned on customer support, whatever. And I think a lot of founders feel totally overwhelmed by having to be across all of those areas early on. And most people might have a, a strength or expertise in one or two. And then the question that you're faced with is, okay, like, how do I how do I do this? <laughs> and what I have found over time is I basically visualize every single function area as a learning curve and I identify a spot on the learning curve that is the like minimum viable level that I actually need to be at. And so, for example, like with marketing, like I, well, I was like, okay, I need to be at a level where I can effectively brief and I can effectively manage and delegate and hold people accountable and also support a team but I don't need to be at the level of a really good direct execution person. And that would be a terrible like waste of my time. So how do I as quickly as possible get to the point of being able to understand all the metrics, understand a lot of the mental models that different types of marketers are going to be bringing to their, understand what drives different, different types of marketers and then think about, okay, like how do I get there? So that it's a lot of like, where is the actual level of expertise that you need at the stage that you're at? Or for example, like with retailing, which is something that we're looking into a lot more at the moment. So we've started as a direct to consumer online business, but we see a lot of room to expand into larger retailers. That's a space that I know fuck all about. And in terms of like how to learn in that space, one of the things that I found it the most valuable is find the most expert person you can and pay them for an hour of their time and ask all of your dumb questions. And then go build your approach and then come back to them and pay them for another hour of their time to t tell you like why your approach is dumb. And that's like the way that I get up a learning curve for that. So I think I've certainly found like the discipline of how you effectively get up to the right point on each learning curve that you need to be on to be something that I've gotten better at over time. And certainly like willing to look dumb in order to, to not make actually dumb decisions is probably a big part of that as well. And I want to double down on that a, a little bit because... What I've heard you just say is that you've made a decision to build something scalable and that you're not going to get into the trench and create the content. You're going to develop the skills that are ensure that the content gets created. And I know it's a function of resources and at some early stage, you've got no choice but to do that. But sometimes founders believe that they have to get into that end trench. The problem with that is you, it's almost impossible to get out at the right time. You, you end up getting yeah. stuck there. Whereas if you can engineer the system wherever possible, not to get into the trench, just ensure you've created the environment where that thing gets done. I, I can't reiterate that enough. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I also agree the resources piece is a really big part of that. And I think a lot of people make this understandable decision early on where they're like, okay, ideally I would like to hire 10 people because there's really 10 jobs to be done in this company and 10 different skill sets required, but I can maybe afford to hire two. And so I need, this person's going to cover three and this person's going to cover two and I'm going to cover five badly. <laughs> and that's the optimal decision at that point in time. But I think there's, you're so right that learning to recognize as soon as possible, like how, what is my path to getting out of that? And what's my path to being able to work on the business, not in the business? Yeah. A lot of people miss that point, particularly if you're stressed and you're trying to do all of those pieces of execution and business as usual, it gets harder and harder. I, I love hey, your description of the learning curve and to Don's point, that you're like your awareness of not being bogged down in the operational capability, but the, the leadership and management side. Do you document your mental models, thinking process? I'm a mental know? model girl. Yes. The way you were describing yeah. it, I'm like, yeah, use my little <laughs> language. Yeah. But how did you develop those frameworks? And for founders who may not be aware of these sorts of concepts, could you just articulate how you approach those mental models, how you refine them? Yeah, certainly. I think maybe to be like, what are the mental models that I end up using very frequently? I'd say one of them is like the learning curves mental model, which is essentially what I've just described. So where do I need to be and how fast can I get there? And that's something that you can probably revisit every like month or quarter, depending on how fast the business is changing to basically say, okay, is the business moving into a new phase where I need to be working differently or people around me need to be working differently? And perhaps something that could be useful there is it's a really good way of 
or a, a useful just add to it is it can be a very helpful way of avoiding trying to be good at everything. Like I think uh, depending what profile of founder you're talking about, some people I think feel the need to go to achieve mastery. And particularly if you're a less experienced founder, you might also feel like if you don't project mastery, then how will other people around you work with you or how can people trust you? And so I think that can end up being very lonely and also very ineffective. <laughs> Certainly like being like, qualified a level of mastery that you actually need on each domain is a really helpful one and learning curves can be great for that. I do think having a really good simple mental model of your business's economics is also uh, super valuable and that is not just like we need to achieve 20% year-on-year growth or we need x percent month-on-month growth in order to unlock our next raise but actually on the level of like literally a break-even cost curse <laughs> I'm being like okay here are fixed costs the variable cost scale with the operations that you have if you are making revenue, like there is a point at which your revenue is like breaking you even and you need to be like have a path to get to that point as your plan B if you are a venture backed business and you need to have, if you don't have a good reason for not achieving that point every month, like you're investing in growth in some particularly valuable way, you need to be hitting that every month. And just, I think like it can be easy to get lost in metrics and then do nothing. And so I find it really valuable to have quite a simple like graph or mental model that you can be like, this is like what sustainability looks like for the business. And then this is any units of growth that occur over and above that need to basically be paying back on X or Y timeline in terms of actual profitability, not just revenue. So that kind of helps me to just be disciplined about what I'm doing. I think another mental model, and I actually owe a lot to my partner on this because I have a strong tendency to try and do everything and he's way up the other end of the spectrum and is a strong minimalist who does one thing very well. I think asking yourself if you add this, it's very easy to add incremental pieces of work into your week or your focus. And I think the like all good strategy is basically saying no to things so that you can say yes to things and be effective at them. And so I think being like being having a very good mental model of this is like the cost of me adding this into my workflow is that this thing over here, like not kidding yourself about the infinite expandability of your time or energy or resources is a huge one as well. And this is the point where you can point out that I technically have two companies and a volunteer thing that I'm doing. <laughs> so it's certainly work in progress. The call to entrepreneurship is <laughs> to do as I say, not as I do. So you're in a good home. I think that's a really good segue to the company Fuzzy. And one of the things Fuzzy does mm. is a negotiation course. Because if I think about the time that I spent in that course, it is a whole series of mental models that did two things. Either explains something that you were doing, and then you could do it a little better. Or for a number of things, gave you a model of things that you weren't doing, and you were leaving opportunity on the table. And thirdly, the repository of memes, I can highly recommend <laughs> as a purveyor of memes. Where yeah. did Fuzzy come from? What was the insight? And I'd, I'd then like to get to why a negotiation course, what do you see founders getting so wrong and, and why is there an opportunity for this in the first place? Yeah, for sure. And I suppose actually, this actually speaks a little bit to another mental model that I'm a big fan of, which is like how I look at careers. And I think often that in your skill set or the, the skill set you've built where you might have 10 areas and you're a six in some and an eight in some and a two in some or whatever, that I often think about how my career has worked and look at it and go, oh, there are periods where I am harvesting from a skill set that I have already built. And so, for example, when I left McKinsey, I was used doing independent consulting. Day rates are very good. And I would do like a couple of days work a week to buy back the rest of my time to experiment with new skills and sort of plant seeds or water seeds in new areas that would help me discover what I was interested in or eventually created a pathway into the startup world for me. So I certainly like, I think the way that this kind of direction of fuzzy has grown has actually come from a similar thing of, I started exploring this on the side as an interest and then just found that I was like, oh, I'm getting really strong signals that there's actually a problem here to be solved and started to go, go into it more seriously. That journey was, I had studied negotiation when I was at Cambridge and the University of Chicago. So I actually took it twice because I liked it that much. It was probably like the perfect combination of my interest in social science and business. But what I, I really valued that experience actually coming into the workforce and particularly as soon as I started working in startups and even at a place like Eucalyptus, which 
like many tech companies in Australia can often feel quite bro or like quite male dominated, was having lots of women come to me privately for help and asking for support with negotiating their equity and their compensation packages. I think not feeling either like they had expertise around the topics or not feeling confident to ask for more or not even knowing what it looks like to ask for more or the language to use. So i at that point, I was like, oh, I'll just like, I'll put something in the Slack and be like, does anyone want me to run a session? And immediately just got this huge response. Ran. I think a lot of people really valued having this area that's often seen as like an innate skill demystified and broken down into a few mental models and then some very specific tactical advice. And so off the back of that, I thought actually I'd really love to do more of this. Posted something on LinkedIn and said, would anyone be interested if I ran a negotiation course? I think the ROI is incredibly high on negotiation. One of those skills that we get very few opportunities to practice, but it can fundamentally change the trajectory of your compensation package as an individual or change the, change the fate of your business as a business owner. And yeah, again, just had that feeling when you can feel product market fit or you can feel product market pull, like people, I think, really resonating with that. And off the back of that, did a whole bunch of user research, <laughs> discovered there were really two personas that couldn't be combined <laughs> into, into one course, which was people who are negotiating for themselves and looking for more confidence and frameworks to negotiate compensation. And then people who were founders or investors or operators in particular functions who needed to be able to negotiate really effectively for, on behalf of the business. And that's the course that Don has uh, been part of, which I think you're iteration number three of it. But to get to your question of, oh, like where do people, I think, fall down when it comes to negotiation? One classic thing that I think I see founders do is assume that you've read Getting to Yes or Never Split the Difference and therefore you know everything about negotiation. And I'd say negotiation is like public speaking and like a lot of other soft skills, not something that can just be learned from theory alone. Like I think it's something, it's one of those skills where actually you need safe places to practice and experiment and get feedback, but we very rarely get the opportunity to do that when the stakes are low. So a lot of people actually don't get to invest in it and leave a lot of money on the table because they haven't invested in that. And so what classically will happen is someone will read getting to yes or never split the difference, prepare for a negotiation. They might actually do quite a good job of preparing for a negotiation, but the moment they get in and something doesn't go their way or they're surprised or even their nervous system is starting to speed up and heart rates fast and they're flushing and they get sweaty hands. Those moments are when you deviate from your plan and you go back to your instinctive style instead of having quite a clear plan for here's the style I want to bring, here's how I'm going to manage my physical reactions and emotional reactions throughout this process. So I think that's a, a classic one is assuming that it, it's just a book skill as opposed to, I think, a skill that needs to be built in practice um, or in race conditions. And that's probably true of everything we teach at Fuzzy. That was like the core insight um, that you, you often need opportunities to practice. I think other things that I see people doing, not preparing. So a lot of founders, I think, um, don't either like you're very time poor, which is genuinely true, or you have, if you've done it before and you've gone okay, I think you forget that there's often an opportunity, like negotiation in terms of like places to allocate your time as a scarce resource in a business, preparing for a good for any negotiation where the difference could be tens or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars is an incredibly good use of your time. And so preparing thoroughly for those experiences and really thinking through what's the like range of each side on each issue, what framing and arguments do I want to bring to it? If they use these tactics, what will I do? Like what negotiation style do I have instinctively? How is that going to interact with theirs? What's the game theory of how I can work with different players in the negotiation to bring those on side and make them into allies? So I think a lot of people forget to do the basics is a really classic one. And probably the third one is assuming that you're not a good negotiator because your style isn't aggressive or isn't like fist banging on the table. I think particularly in tech, we elevate a lot of a lot of people whose personal styles is really like aggressive and arrogant. And we often, I think, portray to founders that's uh, that's what a good founder looks like. And I think it's actually really valuable to be able to walk people through the data. The things they like the data says that is actually in the long run not the most effective negotiation style anyway. Like collaborative negotiators tend to perform better, but also to help people think about. What are your natural personal instincts and identities and experiences around this? How can you leverage the best of them to build a style that feels sustainable for you while compensating for your weaknesses? So thinking about personalization is pretty important too. Just did a lot of talking. I'm very passionate huh. about negotiation. Have you seen the movie Bad Santa? 
No. It's just this negotiation okay. between really? the, uh, the robbers <laughs> and the guy that's effectively extorting them. He just sits there the whole time saying half because he wants half the money. <laughs> And the other guy says 10%. He says half. He says 12%. And anyway, they end up at half. Anyway, I'll send it to you. I think it would be good. Uh, One of the call outs I'd like to do, in your description of what you started, you didn't go off, build a course, spend months, develop a whole lot of stuff, do it in isolation, and then try and bring a product to market. You put the vibe out there, hey, anybody find it interesting? And I think that, I don't want to sound too oversimplistic, but It is so important to get that early product market fit testing with an MVP that probably wasn't perfect and then scale up. Whereas too often, and and what we try and tell entrepreneurs, if you're not embarrassed the first time you launch your product, you've waited too long. Oh yeah. No, it's so true. And I think also differentiating between, if you do put an idea out there, differentiating between the well-meaning but lightly felt affirmation of family, friends, and people in your network from like deep, hard, real product market pool is really important as well. I think one thing that I think I'm actually good at, I'm not particularly sure why, but I think it's actually understanding, like picking problems that where people feel deep, a really deep need for help. Like I think sex as a space, we've always felt this like product market pool with normal where, and and I think similarly with this, like I was like, I recognize this feeling. I've got muscle memory for the feeling. I, I remember looking back at like the particular LinkedIn post and I was like, there was like a huge number of comments. My DMs got flooded and I was like, oh, like that's what pool is. And anything short of that, I think I would almost give people the advice, like if it feels lukewarm, take that signal because it's hard enough building a business around something where there's a really deep pull because you still have to get the business model right and you still have to get like the execution right and you still have to see whether it'll scale. There's a ton of other things to solve that it's really hard to solve if you're not sitting on like a problem that people actually care about. It's such a good point. And and there'd be a lot of founders who haven't experienced that pull to actually understand how that feels when the market is actually. Yeah. And it's, it's also, it's tough as well because I think like it can be a really frustrating place to be in where you're testing idea after idea and you're not necessarily getting a lot back and and it can be it can feel as though I think people often develop self-doubt they start thinking like am I just vamping here should I just commit to something is my threshold too high and I, I would say I think keep just looking for that strong signal even if it's from a relatively small group I think like very strong signal from a small group who can show you like who can who are a pathway to a larger market in some form is much more valuable than jumping in on lukewarm signal but you you will also probably have views on this because you get to see a lot of founders go through this journey i imagine oh 100 percent you're definitely articulating something that we see a lot of founders struggle with and the other i think the other shout out for me was the way you described the two customer segments like those two customer percent you didn't conflate them into anyone who experiences this you actually identify those two and recognize you need to treat them separately. I doubled my workload. That's what I did. I was like, I'm going to build two courses at once. <laughs> but, I think for a lot yeah. of founders, they get lost in saying, we, our customer is anyone who experiences this problem, regardless of domain. Then, They're getting that. Then you need different channels. You need different marketing messages. You, you almost sometimes even need a different brand. So yeah, shout out to the fact that you actually did that very early. I appreciate that. We actually, it was funny as well. Like I think when we first ran the courses, they were, you could tell the difference between the groups. So in, I would jokingly refer to them in my head as the dolphins and the sharks, because a lot of the people who were in our group that was thinking about negotiating for yourself are really excellent individual contributors who were struggling with taking that skill that they have in their core job and being recognized and valued for it. And so a lot of that was about confidence and kind of unpacking the pieces of identity that might make you feel that you're not being a team player or that people will perceive you in ways that don't align with how you want to be seen for uh, advocating for yourself. Whereas the other group, like lots of founders and operators were much more, yeah, I'm game. And they were like, we want scoring systems. Let's do it. <laughs> like they're very much more, I think, competitive and in the way that they approached it from the beginning. One of the things that you did really well, and, and I think this is just more of a, a learning for founders, is I saw your course on social. Mm. My brain recognized that I know I've got a problem with negotiation. The problem is in the position that I sit in the world, I'm supposed to be really good 
at negotiation. <laughs> and so when I saw that course, my default reaction was, I can never really do it anyway, because then I'd have to admit to the world that actually I think I'm weak there. And then there was some content that you put out of some social proof of people from other VCs with stronger brands than ours, with names that are recognized, that had done the course. And then I went, if that person is able to admit <laughs> that, that they needed to improve their negotiation, I can grow up and do that as well. And so I just, I think often founders put too much weight on the product and the problem and don't do enough heavy lifting on the social proof, the validation and almost making it okay for someone to enter that path. Yeah, I, oh, I could talk about this so long because this is also something where there's a really strong crossover with normal too. Like the, the journey of how do you get someone to feel comfortable buying a sex toy for the first time or engaging with digital sex education for the first time, social proof becomes such a powerful part of that. But yeah, similarly with this area, I, I think one of the things that we really wanted to do when we were creating these small cohorts was also create a lot of like safety for people who might be leaders in their businesses or might be mid-level or senior level in their businesses to be able to speak, like trust that they can practice in this environment and it won't go beyond there and that they can also reflect on their broader life experiences and how it might play out in negotiation and work in a place where that'll be understood and treated, treated with respect as well. So yeah, that was definitely a, a big part of how we thought about it. But yeah, people love a logo rag. Everyone loves a logo rag. You did. You, you <laughs> reeled me in. Well done. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it was interesting where we found something we ran for a while was around founder wellbeing. And when we positioned it as mm. wellbeing and preventing burnout, didn't get the same sign up rate as when we positioned it as high performance, raise more, do this. As soon as yep. we repositioned it, ego got out of the way. And as yes, I'll have some of that, even though the content itself was actually the same, but the messaging and also, yeah, that the, the proof points of certain founders who had gone through. So yeah, it's, they're really interesting insights into human dynamics. What's standing out for me hearing you, Lucy, is that the role of that early social science, like understanding human behavior, I can see that consistently coming through in everything you've been talking about. I think it's funny because it's not a, it's not a very traditional, I think, background for tech, but I do think that if you work in anything that's like innovation or new products of some kind, yeah, there's an enormous amount of value to a good understanding of human behavior. And I think as well, what I've observed in tech is that you'll often see trends happen in where sort of particular insights from academia get pulled out, turned into a, a nonfiction book, probably Malcolm Gladwell or like equivalent everyone reads it for two years, repeats it to each other. But I think there is like a, a richness that gets missed with those sort of smaller insights. And even, for example, like you, you can watch, I think a lot of gross marketers are like incredibly good at seeing the small picture, but don't see the big picture <laughs> where you're thinking about like small tweaks to human behavior and, and to landing pages, but you miss the big picture of there's a difference between selling toilet paper or pet food and a sex toy because of all of the like things like identity and like people's life narratives and in-group and out-group psychology that I think there are actually those. You miss the tectonic plates and you just see us often playing around with the lawn on the surface. So I, I do think there's, yeah, a lot of value in a social science background, which has surprised even me. <laughs> I'm just mindful of time. Do you have a hard yeah. stop at 11.15 or do you have no, a little okay. bit? Yeah, no, we, okay. we can go longer if you want. A little um, bit. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. really, really enjoying it. And again, with Fuzzy, you got branding and messaging really right and you have then been involved in Grapevine. Now, I think that's gotten branding and messaging really right. I think all for the wrong reasons. The fact that it exists <laughs> is obviously at the core, but it does exist. It does need to be highlighted. Can you explain for the listeners what is Grapevine? We've spoken about it a few times on the podcast, but in, could, could you give us a summary? Yeah, I can give it, you the internal views. Yeah. yeah, and certainly those of us who work on it joke that imagine if we weren't um, – doing this as volunteers in our spare time because we, we're all like, this is the best team we've ever worked with. This is incredible. We're doing the best work for our lives here. If I, I'll zoom out to begin with and then zoom in. I think tech in Australia and overseas often has issues with sexual harassment, bullying and bias. And I think one thing that's important to understand about that is 
it's not that there are worse people in any one industry than another. I think something that's that drives that is that there are essentially risk factors that mean that an industry is more likely to experience high rates of sexual harassment. And if you go down that list of risk factors, tech hits like every single one of them. And so that's things like, do you have really informal workplaces that, that blur the boundaries between the professional and the social? Do you have a big gender imbalance in terms of who's in the industry? Do you have a gender imbalance in terms of who has leadership or decision-making capacity? Do you have uh, sort of strong networks of like recommendations or blackballing? So there's like the, the dark side of, I think, the pay it forward, often really generous networking that happens in the tech ecosystem can also be that people know that their next fundraise or their next job is coming from someone who will have a seek recommendations from people who, who have worked with them. And that can have a silencing effect. So as I, I can go down a, a longer list. And if you want to, if anyone listening wants to check it out, I wrote a piece for Missing Perspectives that really goes into this as well. So you're welcome to go take a look at that. But essentially like a tech in Australia ha- meets a lot of those criteria. And I think for a long time, women and men, but this is disproportionately women, have been speaking a lot to each other about the problems of sort of everything from everyday sexist comments through to really quite horrific forms of sexual harassment in the industry. Late last year, a particular founder on LinkedIn who had been like routinely harassing a number of women I knew, including me, like in LinkedIn comments and DMs and everything, made a particularly horrific con- comment and that sort of blew up. And I think got the attention of a lot of people who may not have been engaged in this conversation or sort of aware of it for a long time. What happened after that was a number of women, including myself, spoke to the Australian Financial Review about the fact that as much as this his comments were awful, that he in many ways was sitting on the fringes of the ecosystem and that there was a much wider spread problem that we wouldn't want to be missed in that sort of discussion. After we all spoke to the Australian Financial Review, a group of us actually got introduced to each other and we were like, maybe we should talk (laughs) and started working on a number of initiatives to reduce harassment in the Australian and New Zealand tech ecosystems. One of those is Grapevine. And so with Grapevine, it's a platform for sharing de-identified stories of harassment, bullying and bias that have occurred um, in the Australian New Zealand ecosystem. So people submit their stories and those stories are condensed and written, de- written into kind of a standard format by the Grapevine team. And then they're also paired with advice for stakeholders. So essentially like the stakeholders are arranged in order of power. So if it's a story of I went to a meeting that was intended to be a business meeting at which this senior investor hit on me and told me that I was an idiot for assuming that dinner was not a personal meeting, which is one of the stories that we published. In that situation, there's advice for the person who the harassment has happened to. There's advice for this sort of senior investor. There's advice for their company or their fund and what they should have done differently. And so that's what we wanted to do with Grapevine was, I think, firstly, give people the opportunity to actually hear a lot of the stories that are being whispered about one-to-one and the way to do that safely in a way that's safe for the victims of that harassment is actually to do it in a de-identified manner and then to make sure that we're not just, I think, raising awareness, but actually giving people really pragmatic, practical advice on here's what you can do, whether you're the most junior person in an organization, whether you're the sort of HR lead in that organization, whether you're a founder or an investor, like here's the role that you can play to go from perhaps being a bystander to an ally or go from passive, passive to really proactive in prevention. So that's the goal of Grapevine, which has been running for about the last six months or so. Yeah, it's such an important, critically important service and thing to exist and it is sad that we need it but i think for me and this shows my place of privilege just you reading some of the stories it's absolutely shocked and i think bringing transparency to these stories for more greater levels of understanding is really critical so shout out to what the work you're doing i I think for me the other thing as well is yeah this is a this is an issue globally have you come across any similar initiative anywhere else in the world that's having single at all I think there's been, for example, in the US, there's been a number of people who've taken the pathway of almost fighting a more public battle or a court-based battle against particular employers, things like that. There are certainly, I think, initiatives that are trying to do a lot of the other, really hit a lot of other really important levers for change. One of those is essentially learning and development and training. And that needs to be not just for leaders, but actually like further down in organizations as well. So that's certainly like one really important area, I think, on a topic like this one. Often education and awareness and starting the conversation is a really good first step so that we can all basically say, hey, we know we've got a problem and we we get past the, is this really happening? Is it really that big? 
is it just a few bad apples to being like, no, like we know we have a problem with this issue and we know we all have a role to play to actually being like, okay, how do you equip people with a proper understanding of what harassment is, an understanding of how you can act differently as a leader, an understanding of how you can act differently as a as an individual. And then I think you can also look at stuff that's creating better kind of policies for prevention and management. And there's a real opportunity in Australia at the moment too around this because of the change in harassment laws and the essentially like affirmative duty laws that came in um, late last year. So for anyone who hasn't come across, they are basically where, sorry, where as a company and as a board of a company, Previously, you had what was more of a reactive duty to ensure that you, under the Sex Discrimination Act, ensure that your company responds if it comes across incidents of harassment within that company. Now you actually have, as a board, a positive duty to prevent. And so they, and it spells out what does prevention actually mean and look like. So if you need to have policies like these, you need to be doing this kind of training. So it's essentially like a very clear, like, it is now the board's job to create an organization where this doesn't happen. And so I think in Australian tech, there's a real opportunity to try and leapfrog from where we are, which is a couple of decades behind the corporate world in our understanding of these issues and how we treat them to actually move forward and be like, okay, great. How do we adapt a affirmative duty to prevent in the startup environment? And how do we think about that for a seed stage company who doesn't even have HR and or a series A or B who might have one or two people who might be a more junior recruiter style HR lead to getting up to the Bs and Cs? Or how do you think about in a venture fund? So I think there's a, a really good valuable piece of work to be done in being like, how do we adapt and localize that duty? But I think there's also a really important role for um, venture investors in actually stepping up and being like, what does this look like as boards of tech companies? Like, how do we make sure that we're not giving our money and like our LPs money to founders who are like ill-equipped to handle this or who are in sometimes the problem? Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think the saying is sunlight cures a lot of diseases. And for me, this is shining sunlight on it, but that's obviously not, not enough. It's the first step. Yeah. Needs action. I think this grapevine was then followed, sorry, some work then followed after grapevine that Elaine Stead spearheaded of collecting a lot of resources from the industry. We contributed to that as well. So then it's one thing to have something highlighted. Now there are some resources to actually call upon to use internally. And following that work, we updated some of our internal processes. And even if it's just basic things, like when you sign up to one of our events, there's actually a code of conduct and where would you go to if something was to occur? And that was driven by Elaine and that work. And I think providing those resources is important. And as long as people take the next step to start to adopt, Yeah, definitely. I think that can be a really valuable step. And also, I think Elaine is someone who deserves an awful lot of credit for driving this conversation for a long time as well. And yeah, has has been amazing to work alongside. But we've also, I think in terms of streams of work, there's almost been the grapevine work that's been doing education and awareness. We've seen the kind of resource gathering and code of conduct updating piece of work. And there's a third stream, which I think will become a little bit more public soon, which has actually been raising money for a funded and eventually self-sustaining organization that's helping to provide, for example, a lot of that like training in a way that's like startup relevant and that can be accessed by funds and startups in Australia too. So probably be able to say a bit more about that soon, but we've been very fortunate to have a lot of major players in the ecosystem being willing to put some money behind it, which is great. So yeah, yeah, just another job. Yeah, no, all that. <laughs> What's it to do? It's, it's focused within yeah. in silos, but I, I guess grapevine mm. to me, without wanting to oversimplify it, it's, it's like mm. moving towards a quality of like it's qualities of experience and behaviours and expectations and shining a light on it. And then one of the other streams of work is a quality and investment. It's investment into female founders. What's your view of what the industry should be doing? Can we get to fifty fifty? What do we need to be doing? Yeah, I think the goal should be fifty fifty. And I think that unless you think talent is unequally distributed in the population of Australia, I think it's genuinely, I think the goal should be 50-50 and we should be Um, asking people to defend numbers that are lower than that and be like, okay, tell me about your adjustment and tell me about your pathway to this point. And I I think it's, sometimes it's very easy to um, kind of put this, to be immersed in like the politics and culture of the moment and lose sight of in 20 or 30 years, how will we look at a conversation that is, is unambitious in its goals? So I always think, actually, if I have kids, I assume I would, ha- I would find it very embarrassing to explain to them that we seem to just keep 
massively overinvesting or massively underinvesting in female founders in this ecosystem. I can't really explain why. But um, to be more substantive, because I think the goal is good, but the, the how is important. I think there's like, and I'm not also the best expert on this topic. I think there's people like Pretty Clear who do a really great job on it. So I think there are a few people who I would almost defer to their breakdown of a lot of the issues. And I think there's also been great work done in a lot of funds thinking about their pipeline and how to de bias their pipeline as much as possible. So I think everyone is like trying to have this conversation and trying to work on this issue. But I certainly think that if you're trying to explain why are funding rates so low for female founders in Australia, there's a few directions you can go in. One of those is pipeline. Like we don't have enough people coming through STEM educational backgrounds. Therefore, we have less women entering the tech sector. Therefore, we have less people deciding to become founders, blah, 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 blah. I think there's, there's some merit to that, but I think it can get massively overstated. Like lots of people obsess about the STEM pipeline, but also a lot of Australia's best founders haven't been technical. And I, I think while you need technical knowledge, like in senior levels of a lot of businesses, I don't necessarily think that it is like an adequate explanation of, of our, like certainly a lot of our strongest founders have actually been generalists. And in terms of like the fields that a lot of those people come from, those fields are like 50, 50 female graduates or even like getting towards 55, 45 or 60, 40 in favor of women. So I, I think it's, I don't have a lot of time for the pipeline argument sometimes in terms of talent. I think I have more time for discussions of like networks of like organically formed networks of culture, sorry, organically formed networks of like capital and connections and coaching and those kind of social connections that help you figure out what a really good VC pitch is going to be or help you practice that pitch or introduce you and make or make warm introductions for you. Or even one incident kind of, incident is too strong a word, but like one thing that always sticks in my mind really strongly was I remember watching like a high profile male founder who I knew help a number of people who were their like buddies from work raise raise their rounds when they left his company with his major backer and even go so far as saying, oh, that valuation is not high enough. We'll just like, intervene and do the raise for them, create a competitive environment, go do the raise, like double the size of valuation. <laughs> so I, I think like those sort of social networks are things that we really need to be careful of and grapple with in how we think about who is a hot founder and who like who, who we want to put money behind or who we want to get competitive about. And certainly I also think that there's, I think a lot of places where like unconscious bias can creep into the way that we evaluate founders still, particularly at the early stages. Like you'll hear a lot of investors, I think, use language like they develop a sixth sense for a great founder or develop muscle memory or they know within a couple of minutes and they've got the tingle. <laughs> and whenever I hear that kind of pattern matching, I really worry. I think that there's that's a massive opportunity for very narrow biases to become codified and defensible because that's an incredibly qualitative assessment. I think that the thing that's sort of significant is that founders who get founders who give investors the tingle get given the benefit of the doubt to make a lot more mistakes or get given the benefit of the doubt to get the label of they'll figure it out as they go. And I think the founders who don't do that um, are often asked to come back when they have more evidence and traction. And we see things like female founders being asked a lot more preventative questions where, and there's a lot of data on this, like female founders get asked preventative questions that are about capping downside risk because they're viewed as we can't trust them to figure it out. We need to understand exactly how they're going to do it. Where a lot of male founders are asked like promotional questions like, oh, tell us about your growth approach or like, what do you see as the opportunity here? So I think there's, there are a whole bunch of biases that can often play into the qualitative spaces of startup investment that we need to be really careful about. And I've certainly seen those in action too many times to think it's not an issue. I agree. If you're feeling a tingle in evaluation, you might need penicillin. Um, yeah. Rather than, yeah. Uh, I would just be like, write down the tingle. Please explain the tingle. Can I, can I workshop something with you? I've, it, yeah. It, it, this is a half-baked thought. At the top with venture capital that we're in, and, and I know there's other types, there's, a, there's an expectation of returns. And so part of what I'm seeing is that there's an over-allocation to a certain bucket that's seeking certain returns versus other buckets that could be achieving other returns. And then when I look at the venture capital bucket, I separate masculine energy versus feminine energy. And there's a certain irrationality, arrogance, dictatorship that finds itself often more on masculine energy. And often those things, um, yeah, the irrational exuberance, that's often not associated with feminine energy. It's a half, yeah. it's a half formed thought bubble. 
there is one bit realizing that all of us have masculine and feminine. And that's why I didn't use man or woman. Masculine yeah, but you're like, feminine. But mm-hmm. once it gets into that environment, how do we get equal opportunity to make sure that everyone's got the opportunity, but with certain things at the allocation level, um, I, I look at those. Yeah, I think that that allocation women. decision-making point, there's so much to attack on that. I think a lot of people feel similarly and don't say it. I think, um, and I've heard male and female investors be like, oh, they've just got something. Like they've got, I trust that they're going to obsess about this in a way that is going to drive that business through all the hurdles that it's going to have to overcome. But I, I know what you mean. And I think one thing that is interesting and, and it's tricky with that is that I think lots of women face like the competence, likability, double standard. The tons of experimentation about it. If you Google like confidence, likability bias or whatever, you'll find a bunch of things about it. But there are leadership behaviors that we view in men as authoritative, dynamic, inspiring, make you want to follow someone that when practiced by women, like they are seen as like bossy, unlikable, et cetera. So often women are facing this trade-off of like, do I be authoritative, be direct, be aggressive and be seen as a bitch? Or do I like be likable, friendly, the girl next door who just happened to start the company with? Um, like that worldview. Isn't that um, the girl boss or the girly boss? Isn't oh, that the, yes. The, oh, the, the, the girl boss trap is real. Yeah, that one is, I have very, that's a whole podcast. But yes, yeah, so I, I think that we, women face different penalties for displaying masculine energy. And then I think there's also like an interesting question, which is, do we actually believe that masculine energy makes good company builders? There are probably like lots of male founders who don't necessarily display that, who are often given credit for being like warm and empathetic leaders who are also really effective. Like Brian Chesky at Airbnb is a great example of someone who I think like has like a very like warm and like more kind of considered soft personal style, but no one would question whether he's like a good startup builder or whether he's dynamic. So I think there's different, like we treat the expression of energy really differently depending on who it's coming from. And it's only something I think a lot about. My probably like done the course with me, Don, but like my natural style is probably, I'm a pretty nerdy academic person and I really enjoy connecting with people. And like I, warmth is a big part of like how I want to show up in my interactions with people. But I think one thing that I have, I now like in a lot of conversations with investors, I think I look back on, I'm like, I think I also needed to sit them down and tell them about like the iron steel core at the heart of all of that as well. And be like, just so you're clear, I also grew up and got myself overseas for a degree and funded my way through so that it wouldn't burden my parents and got scholarships the whole way through and then moved to like cities five times in 10 years on my own. And then I left a job with nothing like planned. And then I like self-funded my way through this. And I like fought these, like all of these private battles just so that you know that the person you are dealing with, like I choose warmth, but don't fuck with me. And that's interesting of your perception of yourself versus my yeah. perception. Is I knew oh, very yeah. How did I, <laughs> I knew very quickly that you weren't to be fucked with. And I was actually warned right. that put into a corner, you would eat me alive. Yes, that so is probably it's, funny. It's, the youth founders are always like, they were like, you are very sweet, but you have this look where the warmth goes out of your face and you want to kill us. And, and, and I was like, and, yeah, and that's I, really true. I guess I'm saying if the if the allocators yeah. of funding have those patterns and that those, I think what you're helping me think through is that, okay, the, the money comes through there. First question is my view of what it takes to build a company that fits the venture model of the world. This isn't everything. This is the like $10 billion thing and the perception of, sure, you've got a Brian Chesky, but I've my previous life as a consultant working with founders, there's this underlying ingredients there, but what you're saying is they're hidden elsewhere because if they are expressed, they get penalized. So is the thing there to make sure everyone can express them, even if we don't agree whether those ingredients are required in the first place? Yeah. I would intellectually like separate those propositions and be like, proposition number one is there is a like venture style returns require a founder set of characteristics that include this like more aggressive crash through energy. And I would actually be like, we, I think we have a lot of mental availability. Like we have lots of very highly visible examples of that style of founder building, but actually like trying to do a proper audit and being like, is that proposition true or not? Can you build without it? Is it so dominant that it is a requirement for our investments? 
And that becomes question number one. And then almost like question number two is if we think that this is like a necessary condition for a good founder, I think, for example, you could have a different kind of energy that's a really like smart, thoughtful, long-term strategist who is also like very personable can be a great founder. I think someone who like runs the whole game in their head can actually be a really smart like an effective founder, particularly so like I'm running the whole game. I want really high returns. Therefore, I'm optimizing for that. Like that, I don't know. Anyway, proposition one and proposition number two is if you do think this is necessary to be a good founder, I think being like, are there other ways we can test for it than the vibe we get from chatting from someone? Can we look through someone's life experiences for that kind of perseverance or that kind of like personal resilience or that kind of ability to inspire others. Are there ways to diligence founders that don't let our biases where we pattern match to the way we've seen that expressed before come to the fore? And I think that like what I'm saying about women being penalized often for showing those characteristics can also apply to, I think, people from lots of like other different cultures. And if you've grown up in a culture that's like much more like self-effacing or like less self, like less aggressive or less individualistic, that can be something where actually people really like struggle to express those traits openly or where it's considered rude to express those traits openly there's or even if you're like if you've grown up in a a function like if you're someone who comes from design that is not how people in design talk I've seen this a lot where I think like people who come from like the commercial sides of businesses are much more comfortable speaking in that manner than people who come from creative or customer centric or um, even at times like product sides of businesses so even just thinking about like how can we test for the qualities that we care about without bringing biases where it's like they have to speak like Tim Doyle or they have to, I don't know, like they have to speak like Elon Musk because those people are only one expression of that, that kind of energy. Yeah. Yeah. I think we do need an entire podcast episode on, on this. This is a whole, yeah, this is a much longer topic. (laughs) Probably more like a podcast series itself. But yeah, Yeah. I think think what you bring into the forefront of my mind is like long-term unconscious biases that have played out and which have also informed all these data sets and pattern recognitions and what was it how do you describe the tingling sensations yeah like that, yeah that i guess that's the bit that we haven't yet seen that being removed to then have the data sets to actually and i, I do think that i do think there's some structural actually the, the structure of vc and the power law dynamic I, I think there's some can i just add one one thing really quickly what, what I find fascinating as well is like Australia is an ecosystem that in some ways, like it should pattern match to Mel Perkins. Like why are we pattern matching to anything else? <laughs> and it's so interesting that we don't, but yeah, well, go on. I think Sorry. Canva, yeah. I mean, Canva yeah. is the example. So we at Tribe believe in complementary teams of all different skills and energies. And when you have a look at Canva between Mel and Clip, you can separate into different energies and external and internal and how do we go from where we are at the moment towards that 50% number. I think a stepping stone is a recognition of complementary, which by definition means difference. And then once we're moving towards complementary, it means there's a better recognition of differences. I guess that's the way I try and simply look towards that path. Do you think as well, like I I also, I'm probably looking at this with the lens of having done solo founding and and so having to, like you don't get the benefit of being complimentary, you have to embody all of the various pieces in one. But I wonder about, do you have mental models, for example, what needs to be in the founding team versus what founders can hire for around them? We subscribe to a a model called PAEI, which is from the Adesis Institute, where an organization of any size, but especially an early stage business, has to P for produce, A, administrate, E, the entrepreneurialism, and you also have to have the I, the integration, PAEI. And so producing is short-term effective, administrating is short-term efficient, so P and A. But there are companies that were making horsewhips in the age of the automobile that would have been very effective and efficient in the short term. So you need to have the E, the entrepreneurialism, and you also have to have the I, the integration, PAEI. And one of the challenges with sole foundership is that each of those ingredients is in conflict. P, A, E, and I is in conflict. And when you're trying to spin P, A, E, and I plates, it's very hard. Now, what a founder's predominant energy, it's P, get shit done. But it's E, new ideas. And what are they often not so good at? The A. (laughs) And the I is often wrapped up in themselves rather than being an organic system. And so is it possible to be a sole founder? Absolutely. You just have to have more mental models. And it sounds like you're doing a really great job of that. But the A and the I are always the things that develop a little bit late because your interest is always the P and the E. 
And so when we're analyzing a business, we're often analyzing whether it's an individual founder or a team of founders, is PA and I represented? We know that an early stage business is predominantly P, predominantly E, but do we believe they can develop the A and the I over time? And that's often where we come to try and help them develop. Interesting. Yeah, sounds, sounds like a good mental model. Also very much identify with the, there are downsides to being a solo founder, which include having to be too many things at once. (laughs) But you can use your calendar as a blunt instrument because you acknowledge the learning curve. You actually have said, I need to have a threshold of this. And that's what you focus on. Whereas a lot of sole founders don't, they get some momentum and then fall over because they haven't done that work that you've done. Yeah. I think also I've I've probably spent a long time thinking about who do I want to be at work and how am I going to show up? And what does that mean about the balance between vision and holding people accountable or whatever it is? There's a little bit of, you have to do a little bit of extra work to define for yourself who you want to be at work because otherwise those cross currents will just pull you in every direction. Speaking of PAEI, we've got to be mindful of your You're supposed to be producing work. Yeah. In the <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's been a really interesting chat. I, I really enjoyed um, meeting you, Aaron, and yeah, getting to chat more about this, John. Uh, Lucy, this has been a fantastic chat. I, uh, I, I really enjoyed it, and I, I would love to have a, another chat and go deeper on a lot of this <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you have a particular episode you want to get into, let me know. Um, yeah, so- I think there's several that have come out of this one. So- <laughs> Thank <laughs> yeah. you, <laughs> Yeah. Um, awesome. And I'm going to yeah. put all the links to the things that you've mentioned. We'll awesome. put the yeah. upcoming course on negotiation in the show notes. Please check that check. out. And Lucy, we look forward to catching up again. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thanks. Bye.